she's just shopping at an outlet. She has this vision and communication she receives from her friend who she knows is in Great Britain, but she didn't know she's dying. Friend comes to her and says, hi, I just had to go. I, it was my time. I don't, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, you know this, but I was very, I'm very, I was been very sick and I'm just leaving. I want to say thank you. I love you for our friendship and I'll, you know, I'm going to be fine. I hope to see you again. Well, Allison describes never stopping shopping, even walking out to her car. And there's this communication went on for like, I don't, I can't remember if it was 20 minutes or 40 minutes. And finally, when it's over, she stops and she goes, oh my God. And then she gets a phone call and she looks at the cell phone and she sees it's coming from UK and she goes, oh, I know who this is. This is going to be a mutual friend who's going to say, my friend just died. She picks it up and she goes, hey, I got some bad news. She goes, I know. Welcome to What the Fuck Just Happened. I'm your host, Liz Enton. If you listen to the intro, you know my story. If not, here's a brief summary. I'm a science skeptic, and when my dad died, I took a shot in the dark and decided to investigate if there was any possible evidence of an afterlife. I assumed that was as realistic as Santa Claus, but I was desperate. However, I was so blown away by what I discovered that I wrote a book and launched this podcast. In this podcast, I will be talking to some fairly normal people about some really weird shit. I speak with everyone from psychic mediums and afterlife researchers to ordinary people who've had some inexplicable experiences. So come, listen, there's no need to draw any final conclusions. Keep an open mind and wonder, what the fuck just happened? Hi guys, I have a guest I'm really excited about today. His name is William Peters. He is the author of At Heaven's Door, What Shared Journeys to the Afterlife Teach About Dying Well and Living Better. And the shared death experience is one of the most fascinating, what I consider evidential aspects, bodies of research of, for, of an afterlife evidence. So I think William can take over and do a better intro about himself than I can. Hey, thank you, Liz. Glad to be here. And yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm going to talk today and I really appreciate you, Liz, just kind of telling me what you're most interested in, because I know you know your viewers better than, than I do. But yeah, I'm a psychotherapist by training, uh, and I have become a researcher, and indeed, I, I think this is true, I'm the world's leading researcher on a particular end of life experience called the shared death experience. And this is an experience where somebody dies, and a caregiver, loved one, and sometimes just a bystander, often a healthcare worker, hospice worker, will report that they shared in the journey of the dying into an afterlife. And they, in the terms we hear is into an afterlife. I, what I hear all the time is I, I was with my loved one as he or she or they were going into the afterlife. And I saw all these, you know, phenomena. And so I'll, I'll say a few other kind of descriptors to help you all understand what the SDE is. Oh, by the way, we call it the SDE, not for, you know, shared death experience. And it's the dominant motif in an SDE is travel. There is this sense that at the time of human death, the soul, spirit, consciousness, whatever you want to call it, uh, that survives human death moves out of the human body and begins this journey. And it's a journey that, that experiencers uh, assert is the initial stages of the afterlife. And the other piece about this is the phenomena that is observed, witnessed, or sensed, because there's different ways that they, they accompany the dying or experience the dying in this transition, matches almost identically to the same phenomena we see in the near-death experience, was suggesting that there's a similar terrain that both NDE experiencers and 
SDE experiencers are observing, but obviously through a different lens, if you will, a different vantage point. In the NDE, they're experiencing this uh, phenomena, if you will, this landscape of the afterlife as one who's brushing with death, one who's actually uh, their body, physical bodies under stress and they're into this landscape themselves. In the SDE, they are not under stress. They're healthy in mind and body and they are merely hitching a ride with the dying and observing, sensing, experiencing the same phenomena that the dying are uh, experiencing themselves. So, and then the last piece I'll say about this is that the SDE uh, is perceived as a gift by the experiencer. It is a very transformative experience, but transformative because what they see and experience is the most profound experience they've often had in their life and assert that what I saw, what I experienced was more real than any other experience I had in the human dimension. And we hear this in our now over 250 uh, deeply analyzed cases uh, in, in the Share Crossing Research Initiative, which I direct with my team of researchers. And I just found this book, the evidence, the stories, they're very helpful and healing because A, they align with near-death experiences and, you know, which I know we've talked about quite a bit in this podcast. And also they show that we're able to connect with our loved ones through dimensions in some way. And they're also veridical, which we will talk more about today. But I'm really interested in hearing what's your story? How did you get into this in the first place? Yeah, so, you know, I was growing up in, you know, what is now Silicon Valley, living a rather typical suburban life when at 17 years old, I suffered a high speed skiing accident and I crushed my spine and was catapulted out of my body. And this, as I'll share with you, was a classic near death experience, because as soon as I popped out of my body, was actually, I was kind of violently forced out of my body. And I'll say I, the I I'm referring to is this observing, witnessing aspect of self, uh, consciousness, if you will, the my personal consciousness that identified as, you know, an I, a me. And the reason I know this so clearly is when I first was catapulted out of my body, all I could see experience, you know, was just darkness, but I had a big eye, a big observing self in the midst of all this. All I noticed was darkness, nothingness, and yet I was there. And then all of a sudden I felt this pull upon me and I was then moving away from my body and the lights went on gradually from the inside out. And so the, the first thing I really remember seeing the light was a bit blinding. And then I saw my body on the ski slopes. And then I was moving away. I saw Lake Tahoe, which is right near where the ski area was, San Francisco Bay Area, Colorado Rockies, continental North America, and then a satellite view of planet Earth, all beautiful, enthralling, no pain in my body at all, or no pain in anything that I would call me. And yet there was a life review going on at the same time. Every aspect of my life that I had experienced was being shown to me in a beautiful kind of movie, uh, a movie of clips, if you will, of my life. And I could really feel the karma of all my actions, too. <laughs> I remember a little one where I was like six years old and I got in a little bit of a tussle with one of my neighbors and pushed him off his big wheel and he cried and went into his house and he cried to his mother and his mother got upset at the husband and the husband kicked the dog, that type of thing. It was kind of the trickle effect, the ripple effect of my initial mean action. Uh, and it was those types of things I was observing and realizing, wow, everything I do matters in the human realm. And then I was in this tunnel, pretty classic NDE, and I could see the rib tunnel. I could see the beautiful cosmos all around, beyond. It was just gorgeous. And I was enthralled by it. And then I saw the light. And when I saw the light, unlike most near-death experiencers, 
I was not pleased to see the light because I realized I was dying and I did not want to die. And I, and I eventually uh, was in the light and I was basically arguing with God. I called that light God. I grew up Catholic, so I projected God onto that light. And I just said to the light, you know, I got to go back. I did not accomplish what I incarnated in this lifetime to do or be or whatever. I had no idea what that was. I mean, I was 17 years old. I just realized I don't want to go back and do childhood again. Uh, I want to get back and do the work of my life, so to speak. And eventually I felt this pushback on my body and I started kind of head, spinning back to what I, what I realized would be planet Earth. But as he or she or, you know, whatever that power is, pushed me back, I heard uh, in an own telepathic way, make something of your life. And I, that, those words run, have rung in me since that moment, and it's been the kind of the litmus test for every action I, I take, certainly as I've grown older, even more so. But I did get back to my body, uh, although my body was you know, severely injured. I lived the subsequent you know, three decades in chronic pain, unable to sit because of a spinal injury, unable to walk at times, all sorts of injuries, foot injuries, you know, all sorts of things that just made my life quite painful. Uh, eventually, you know, I'd have another SD, I had another NDE that was just a briefly, I'll, I'll describe that. I had a rare blood disease, idiopathic thromocytopenia, which is a, it's a hemophiliac condition. Basically, I, I, I couldn't, my blood went clot. So I was in danger of drowning in my own blood. And in that ICU, I, uh, I passed out in the emergency room. And when I woke up in the ICU, I was on the ceiling. I was looking down at the nurse's station on the ceiling. May I ask how old you were when you had your second NDE? Yeah, I, I was, let me get that down. I was 32 years old. Yeah, 92. So now I'd be 30 years old, exactly 30 years old. So so yeah, and and then in the ICU, I was a free floating consciousness again, and very similar to what I remember in my first NDE. But I observed life in the ICU and in the tenth floor of Kaiser Hospital Oakland. I was moving around, you know, ta- watching janitors, and 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 the way that I actually came to and realized uh, that I was that my physical human body was there was that the nurses talked about this guy in bed three who was really healthy and they had no idea why he was there. I said, that's kind of interesting. I wonder who that guy is because the rest of the people were all heading towards death. And they said, this guy was really remarkable. And, and I looked over and I looked at my face and I saw my face on the, in the bed. I go, oh my gosh, that's me. And I thought to myself, well, that's interesting. That's my me, but I'm up here. So I had this really moment of existential kind of crisis of like, well, well, who am I? Like, what? how can I be up here? So this was really shocking to me. And you might think that because of my first NDE that I would have, you know, I, I always did kind of believe in an afterlife, but I didn't really get the relationship so distinctly um, from the kind of, how to say this, but the non-essential nature of a human body for consciousness. It's just a vessel or a vehicle. And I've, I felt it a number, I felt it in, in my first NDE, but really in the second one where I was just cohabitating in the ICU with it. And I was apart from it. I felt no connection to it. So, uh, and eventually of course I'd come back into that body. And when the doctor, uh, the hematologist, the specialist came in and tapped on my hand and called out my name and, I did go back into that body and realized that when I went back into that body, I was now looking at the doctor from the bed as opposed to when he was asking the question first of me, Mr. Peters, Mr. Peters, I was looking at him from above, seeing the crown of his head. So, so those are the experiences that got me into this. And I, you know, I should say that I also got into Zen Hospice uh, in night in two, around 2000 and Zen Hospice project of Sam, of, um, Zen Hospice Project in San Francisco, which was a very progressive hospice, still is. In those days, it was very cutting edge. Uh, and I was re- working at Laguna Honda Hospital, the, the large public hospital that had you know 24 beds, open ward with people dying all the time. So I was around death and dying 
all the time when I was, uh, I was a volunteer there, which was great hospice volunteer. Was it because of your NDEs that you were inspired to go volunteer there? I, I think so. But I also say that, you know, I, there was a lot of cancer in my family. And so uh, a lot of women in particular were dying young. And so I, and I had two experiences. Uh, one, I should say one experience with my grandmother that was profound where I saw her having what I would call a pre-death vision or visitation from some loved ones on the other side. And, and I saw her talking to them and I was taking notes and I went back to my uncle, who's the elder in the family. I said, these are the people that, you know, Nano, that's my grandmother, appeared to be talking to. And, and he goes, what do you mean talking to? I said, no, she was in conversation like we've always seen her. She was gesticulating. She was had inflection in her voice. You could see that she, this was not just a memory or something. She was engaged in conversation. I went through the names and he goes, my God, those are people from her life 50 years ago. Wow. And these were names that you did not know growing up. I had no idea who they were. And there was some rather revealing information that I won't even reveal on the show because it really said some things that had gone on in our family that she was still working out that I didn't know about. When I shared it with my uncle, he was like, yeah, that did happen. Uh, I can understand why he, she would be very upset with that person. And, you know, he told me what was going on, but, you know, I, like I said, just in the sake of confidentiality for my family, I was like, wow. Okay. And when I saw, when I heard that and realized that I knew the exact context of what he was, that what, when I described it to him and, and told him everyone was there, he was like, oh my gosh, really? That person was there too? And, and who was the other one? And I said, all and she, he says, oh, my God, they were all involved with this. So and it was a very upsetting situation to my grandmother. So the point being is these experiences got me very interested in what is going on in and around death. And when I went to Zen Hospice Project, that's what got me into it. I, I had um, a number of shared death experiences. But when I had them. Well, I'll share one. I was just reading to this gentleman, Ron, who was, as we say, unresponsive and had been unresponsive for some time. I had read to him every shift for you know weeks on end. I kept reading him a number of books. He loved to be read books. And you know, for those of you unfamiliar with uh, end of life and hospice work in particular, we all uh, are. We know that the last sense door to go is hearing. So we'll always be talking to our patients, even when they're unresponsive, because we believe that they may be hearing us. So I was reading him this book regularly. And then on one afternoon, I was reading it and I just popped out of my body. And there I was above my body and Ron's body. And, and I was seeing the top of my head. I was watching. I was still reading. I mean, I looked down and I was still reading. So I was in a parallel universe. And then I looked to my right and there's Ron. And so, and I'm looking down, there's Ron in his bed prone and there's Ron next to me, extremely elated, a big smile, only his face. And he said to me as if to say, check this out, check this out. And I was like, wow. And as I, you know, as we were engaging, we're not speaking, just kind of telepathically connecting. I was like, I, he was telling me like, yeah, this is kind of where I've been. And I was like, Whoa. And he was kind of smug about it anyway. So, but I mean, I liked him, don't get me wrong, but it was just like, and I was kind of taken back, but then I also realized, wait a minute, I know this space. I've been here before. And I tied it into my two near death experiences. And then I went to talk to my supervisor who I loved. And I said, I just had this experience. And he said, he was a Zen, you know, Buddhist. He said, Oh, William phenomena rolling by, let it go. Very Zen, you know, don't hang. And I'm like, what? So yeah, that was and that was my first uh, and SDE. And the reason I really share that one um, is is because it's a profound experience. It got me really into this, but also to tell everyone that this is 2000, you know, 22 years ago, and and here's one of the leading, most knowledgeable veterans of hospice in Santa Barbara for excuse me in San Francisco for three decades. He'd be doing this work, and he did not have a name or a label or even an interest in this phenomena. It wasn't, into, and I'd have many more of those experiences while I was there at the Zen Hospice, always a bit different, but similar. 
And then, it, so I just didn't talk about it. And then in two in 2009, I met Dr. Raymond Moody. And he's, as you, as you will know, he's was the leading pioneer of uh, in near-death experiences. And he was talking about the shared death experience. And I was shocked. And he described this experience, as I described it already, as being very similar to the NDE, except you don't have to have a brush with death. This happens in caregivers and loved ones to the dying. And when I went up to him after that talk and said, hey, I've had these experiences, he looked at me and said, really? I go, how? He goes, I'm a, I've been a hospice worker. He goes, oh, really? And we talked a little bit more about it. And I said, well, how much research is on this? He goes, nothing. No one's even looking at this. He says, yeah, there's old stuff about these experiences. You know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talked a little bit about it. Some other kind of parapsychology type people, non-ordinary experience, you know, oriented people, uh, you know, but not until the, like it was the late 1800s in Great Britain where the, the London Society for Cyclical Research, which is a very known early research institute into non-ordinary experiences, they had a number of these experiences, which I read about, and also great, um, a great book in 1926 called Deathbed Visions by Sir William Barrett. He was part of the London Society for Cyclical Research, and his book, written posthumously, had 57 accounts of what he called deathbed visions, but 17 of them, by my estimation, are shared death experiences. So I knew that they were out there. Uh, but no one had really categorized them or they just lumped them in, in with other, uh, you know, apparitions at death, as they call them, you know. So but no distinction for this particular experience. So I started the first research project in the world dedicated to this and hired a researcher, got a medical director uh, and went to town on this. And here we are now, I guess I'm eight, nine years into this and these cases are everywhere. Uh, I mean, like I, I, we, we, we can't process enough of them. That doesn't mean if your listeners have a great case like this, we want to hear it and we want, we collect them and then we'll eventually give you an interview. Uh, and we're also interested in all sorts of end of life experiences because we're, I, I've also created the spectrum of end of life experiences for all these spiritual experiences that occur so that, so that healthcare providers and the regular ordinary people know about this landscape of spiritual experiences at the end of life and soon after a death. Well, I have a few questions. First of all, what are some more experiences? I know there's terminal lucidity, which is when someone has been basically unconscious, unable to speak or not, you know, in the case of Alzheimer's patients, not making any sense. And then the day before they pass, they suddenly are having these healthy, normal conversations and it seems like they're getting better. And it's... Oh, that's, I know one of them. What are a few of the others? So I basically think that the most profound end of life experiences that all of us are going to be familiar with in one way or another, once you hear them, the first is pre-death premonitions. It is amazing how many people sit in my clinical office, my consult room and tell me with a, with a terminal diagnosis, say something like, you know, I knew this was going to happen. You know, they have a terminal diagnosis of cancer or they've lost a loved one in a car accident. And they say, you know, three weeks ago, I had a dream this would happen. And I'm like, I mean, if you ask as a clinician in grief and bereavement, did you have any idea this would happen? You'll be shocked if you're a clinician about how many people will say, well, it's funny you ask that. I don't want to really, I didn't want to acknowledge this because I thought that I might have had a role in the death of this person. And I'd say that, you know, that's just, you know, not rational thinking. But you can see where they don't want to talk about it because then they say, well, why don't you do something about it? Or why don't you, you know, all sorts of what it could have should have come up. So they kind of stuff this. And uh, but yet it's really predominant in my office. I hear it all the time. So I collect those, too. And my whole team goes over them. And then we also have pre-death visions and visitations. And those are pretty obvious and pretty well studied now. There's a Dr. Christopher Kerr out of Hospice of Buffalo did a quite extensive study. And he found that about 80 to 90 percent of his inpatient hospice um, patients, these are people dying, and they reported having visitations from deceased loved ones who were there 
to comfort them, there to let them know that their time was coming. Uh, and then the, the experience that you mentioned, Liz, is great, the terminal lucidity. This is this experience where uh, the dying, typically very close to death, I mean, hours, most days, are often unconscious, unresponsive, even you know gripped by, by cognitive decline, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, what have you. And all of a sudden, they come to, they get conscious, they get more vitality, they get clear of mind, and they start conversing with their loved ones, often around the bedside. And the people at the bedside are saying, hey, look at granny's coming back. And in fact, it's just the opposite. It's a harbinger for death as imminent. You know, and, and just for, for, um, for give a good popular example of this, Steve Jobs. He'd been, he'd, you know, he had um, a liver cancer and had been metastatic and he'd been unresponsive. And Mona Simpson, his sister, describes moments before he died, he, oh, he opened his eyes and she's like, what? Opening your eyes? You're like, I haven't done that in, you know, days here. And he opens his eyes and gets big and he goes, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. Now, the question is, what is he, what is he looking at? Uh, but from our point, that's an example of terminal lucidity. He was coming to awakening and he ex exhibited a type of vitality and clearness of vision and expression that he hadn't done in days. And, uh, and then he died. He died at that moment. So we, so we see this. And then the, the, top, the, the other experience in, our, in this spectrum is shared death experiences. I've already talked about those. We can go into more detail there because that's really one of my specialties. But then there's post-death visions and visitations. And that's after the, the person has died, the deceased comes back. And there's a couple of types of that. Uh, there's what I call direct post-death communication, which is in the ensuing days or weeks, the dying seem to speak directly to the questions that the surviving loved ones have. So that in, in my research, when I talk to these experiencers, they'll report, well, it was like I had I had these thoughts. I was thinking some things. I didn't even know what I was thinking about. Like I was thinking about how are we going to do the funeral procession for my mom? And then all of a sudden she came into my mind and said, you're going to do this, 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 and this. And you're going to see, you know, Uncle Charlie there. And I want you to say this at my eulogy. And they're like, wait a minute, where are you? I thought you were dead. And, and this is direct post-death communication. And it happens quite frequently. And then there's also direct, uh, excuse me, then there's also um, post-death visions and visitations, which are just as they sound. You, the, the experiencer reports they're in bed and they look to the corner, they just all of a sudden at the foot of their bed or in the corner of the room, they see the image of the deceased right there. And oftentimes the, and almost every time that uh, visitor, if you will, the deceased visiting will come with a message. And the message is typically, I want you to know that I'm okay. And they will often look younger and, and healthier and vital. And it gives the surviving loved one this sense that, oh my gosh, my loved one departed is alive and well somewhere. And so there's, there's many types of those visions and visitations. Some people see them sitting at the breakfast table where they sat every day, you know, uh, but they're compelling and deliver that message that their loved one is alive and well somewhere. And I should also mention that synchronicities happen throughout, before death, at death, around death. This is clocks, you know, the electrical stuff happening, like lights blinking, digital clocks freezing at the times that reflect anniversaries, birth dates, what have you, key dates of their lives. And the people think they're crazy at first, but then when they say, you know, you know, that clock has not worked in years, but every day at 315, it goes off. And that's funny because that's when we used to talk every day, me and my partner for 20 years, you know, we'd sit there at that table next to that clock and it hadn't worked for the last 10 years of our relationship. But now that I, now that he's dead, every time I sit down at that, go, go by at 315, it goes off. And that's when we met every day. So they put two and two and two and two and two together and they go, wait a minute. Something is going on here. I'm either crazy or there's something coming through that clock. So there's the spectrum of end of life experiences. Um, but Liz, yeah, thanks for asking. I mean, what? Yeah, how can I help understand what you know? What's the most compelling about this? Because I know you're. I really appreciate your scientific background. Your 
you look for the evidence and, you know, so do I. I mean, you, you hear me saying, and you might think I'm an advocate for all this. I am an advocate, but I didn't come to this. I didn't come. To, I wasn't born this way. I was like, are you kidding me? You know, this stuff, this is, this is all hallucinations and, you know, m- want to believe stuff. But after the research, um, I'm quite convinced that there's something profound going on here. I actually want to back up and ask you one question, because it's not too often to get someone who's experienced both an NDE, let alone two, and an SDE, and multiple SDEs working in hospice. How do you feel are the differences between those for you in terms of profundity, in terms of experience? I'd be curious to have a comparison. Yeah, great question. Yeah, we're just, uh, we're just, my teams and I are writing an article right now for International Association for Near Death Studies that actually compares these two experiences. Or it's ready to be submitted. So you're asking at a good time. Um, the, the first distinction is one of perspective, vantage point for, for the experience. I mentioned this before, but it's really important when I point out some of the differences phenomenologically. First, when you're having a near-death experience, you are the experiencer going through the, the veil. You are having the direct experience with your body compromised, a, a real threat with death. And so in a certain sense, you know, you're, you're experiencing a trauma that's driving you. Uh, in a shared death experience, you are observing somebody dying. You're observing their experience and the space they're in. So one key distinction begins this way. The most dominant feature in the shared death experience is seeing the dying. 51%, perhaps more, in our first round of research suggested, or I should say that the experiencers reported seeing or sensing the dying during this journey. All right. Of course, that is not possible in the near-death experience because it is the near-death experiencer themselves who are having the journey. So once again, we're talking about a difference of perspective and and, and a difference in phenomena, a slight difference in phenomena in terms of how you perceive it. So there's that. The other difference is in the light, in the NDE, the light appears 75% of the time, which suggests that in the NDE, you're getting much more, you're getting closer <laughs> to uh, the end of your life because the light is the, if you go into the light, typically depending on how far you're going to the light, you're not coming back. Um, so the light is the gateway. As far as I'm concerned, you exit through that light. And so in a, in a shared death experience, light appears in a lot of different ways. You have the big luminous light that you see in the, in the NDE, but you also see cascades of light you see that's like serves as bridges or channels of light that you can travel up. Uh, uh, and, you know, travel up means as you do, as you accompany your loved one in their transition, there's typically an ascension feature. You're moving upwards. Uh, that's also somewhat common in an NDE. And so the light is slightly different. The similarities are that you see deceased loved ones. In both the NDE and the SDE, you see deceased loved ones. You see beings of lights described differently. Could be angels, could be elevated beings, could be guides, spirit guides. They're defined differently, but they're there. And and in the in the SDE, we see that about 16, 70% of the time, almost, you know, probably one sixth, one sixth of the experiences has that feature in it uh, of seeing an elevated spirit being. So heavenly realms are common in both. Life reviews are common in both. The difference in a life review for an SDE experiencer is you can either observe the dying's life review. You can you can share in the review of your life together with that person. So your life and the dying's life together. Wait, you can have a life review in an SDE? Absolutely. And you can have, there's, there's three types that I've identified. One is you observe the dying's own life review. So you're watching a movie of their life. You can see a, a kind of a movie of your life together with that person who's dying. And the third one is you can have your own life review. The third one is the least common, uh, but we do see it. I mean, it's like, and we see it, we go, oh yeah, 
Okay, that again. So, I mean, if there's anything that I could say to anybody who would naturally doubt these experiences and just say, wow, this is just too hard to believe. I would say this, I get it. But as a researcher and a clinician who has, I in my clinical office, when I started studying this and put the word out, I mean, I started getting I, I, dozens a month of people calling me saying, hey, I, I heard you're interested in this experience. Can I come in and share it with you? I said, sure, come on in. You know, and 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 what I was just blown away by was the pattern. The pattern of these experiences is so compelling. It's you would be making a serious error in judgment if you could not identify the significance of the patterns that come up over and over and over again. And the phenomena is largely the same. It's just every, every experience is unique, but the patterns are profound. And I want to share, if I may, Liz, uh, the dominant, the, the ways in which these, the ways in which these happen, just a few more features. So um, there's at bedside SDEs, which is about one third of the time. Then there's remote SDEs, which are largely the same in terms of phenomena, two thirds of the time. Uh, and then you can have a uh, an SDE that happens, they typically happen right at or around the time of death. But we have 9% of these SDEs that happen a few moments, hours, and sometimes up to a day or so uh, before an actual medical die, medical determined death. Wait, I have a question about the before. Is that when someone's terminal or will it ever just be someone has an accident or a heart attack? They're typically under stress, for sure. Yeah, it's not like you just, a day before they have it, and that's a great question. I've never had that one asked before. That's great. They have to be in some sort of health decline to stress uh, that I'm aware of. I, don't ha- I haven't seen anything other than that. Well, you know what? This is very interesting. I have one case with Jean. She had, a, one month early, she had a remote SDE life review of her father's life. So she's out in her garden gardening and she all of a sudden sees a vision of her father and sees his life reviewed to her, just his life. Now he, he was old and aging, but he wasn't, and he was ill, but she didn't think he was dying right then. Typically they, they happen right when there's distress. And, oh, that's so interesting about her father. So did she see things about his life she didn't know? Was it just the two of their life together? Or were there parts of his life that she was not part of that she experienced? So she saw his entire life, or the most important parts of it. She saw things she never knew about him. It was very revealing and healing for her because they had a good relationship but like every human being, there's some idiosyncratic behaviors that we wish our partners or friends or loved ones didn't have. So she got to see all that. And then when it was over, she said, OK, well, I don't know what that's about. But he died a month later. And was some of it verified too? some of the stuff she hadn't known? Uh, yeah, I think she went back and talked to her mom, actually, and said, you know, this is what I saw. And she, goes, she said, oh, yeah, that happened. Oh, yeah, that happened. That is amazing. Yeah. I have to ask the question that I think a lot of us probably think about, and sometimes this might be a slightly hard question for some people, but I think we all would have liked to have had this experience, but we didn't. Why do some people have this and some don't? And the second part of this is that, unfortunately, most of us are going to have a lot more deaths in our future. Is there anything we can do to try to ensure this could happen or at least increase the possibility or probability of this getting to happen with future deaths we're going to have. Yeah, thanks. And you just asked the uh, the holy grail of the SDE. Why does it happen to some and not to others? It's also the holy grail for the NDE. You know, the, we just don't know why. Although, although so there's some there's some important data points and I'm kind of one of them, that it seems like when you have one of these experiences, an NDE or an SDE, it sets you up to have more of them. <laughs> In other words, it's almost like it's an initiation. And I think the initiation is kind of energetic. 
I mean, I, I look at ourselves as we're energy. And once we cross that threshold, usually you only cross the threshold under a great deal of stress um, to your body. And it does something to your electromagnetic field, if you will. And which in my language and perhaps others, more esoteric traditions would just call that a soul or spirit or something. But once you have one of these, our research suggests that you're going to have more. So for example, 41% of our SDE experiencers will have more than one SDE. That's pretty amazing. They're pretty lucky. They are lucky. I mean, I would, they're luckier that it's lucky that they're having SDEs and not NDEs. Um, So uh, yeah. And then, and then the other thing we see is that if you're looking for a type of person that has an SDE, we're going to, we're studying that right now. I, that's one of the things I'm very fixated on. Like, so how can I answer this question that Liz is asking? Like, who has these things? Well, one characteristic I've seen is that, you know, and to be clear, as a psychotherapist, I, I don't find the personality types to be very helpful for this. I, I think there's a, I would use a different term. I think there's a mind type. I think if you're open minded, if your mind is supple and capable of being receptive and attuned to not just your own body, you know, phenomena, your own somatic affective experience, but if you're actually able to attune to others, if you have good intuition and good empathy, then I and sympathy and and all and I mean I'm saying those words slowly with the emphasis that you if you can have that affective field of development that allows you to, to attune deeply to the experience of others, these are the type of people that have these experiences. So go to the next step. How do you develop this? You asked. How do you develop this? Well, mindfulness practices of all kinds are wonderful practices to develop these, these, uh, um, I should say, these attuning capacities. And that can be prayer, that can be meditation. I think the more somatic the and affectively oriented these practices are, the more likely they help you attune to what's going on in the room uh, and in around the dying uh, as they're dying. And then the other one is, I mean, like yoga practices and things like in Tai Chi, these are very sensory heightening experiences. And and so that's what we see. Now I'll say this, 67% of our shared death experiencers report having mindfulness practices of some kind. So that's almost two thirds. And that we, we allow that to include, you know, if someone says, you know, I, I, I walk in nature every other day, or I take a walk, you know, in the park every day or every other day. That's a, that's a practice. That's a mindfulness practice. And they're doing that because they're, they're attuning to the environment and they see that it's healing to them. So we count that too. So those are the things I would tell you. Now, if you're really interested in learning how to have these experiences, I should tell you the Share Crossing Project has a program called the Pathway Program, and it trains people how to have these experiences. So we go through a series of steps that really help people develop these capacities. And I do a lot of guided visualizations that will help people know the terrain that they're going to be entering in when a loved one dies. So uh, there is a, there is a formal way to train to have these. And I am grateful to say that uh, over about over 80% of the people that do this program will have some sort of shared crossing experience. And we haven't done the data check yet, but I think about a quarter to 50% would have the SDE. I'm actually interested in trying this. Well, you're in LA, so we're doing it in October. I, I, you know, that I'll be in New York then. Oh God. Ah, but you'll be in New York. Well, I'll do it again, Liz. And oh, there's going to be an online program too. So we'll do, we do, it in per, we do it in person in Santa Barbara in October. This is just going to get put up on our website in the next couple of weeks. And then we're going to do one in November, early November for the online program. So you should definitely do that. If you're interested, you know. I am interested. And I'll post about it here if any of you guys are interested. Great. And let's see. I have another question. Have you had anyone, I know 
you have a lot of people who share shared death experiences with you. Have you had anyone who came in and bef- shared their experience and before their experience, they were kind of like I was like, oh, there's no chance of an afterlife, super skeptical, and their whole worldview has completely transformed. Yeah, we have. Let me just think of a really good one there. Yeah, I mean, I definitely have people that will will call and say, you know, um, I had this experience. I had no idea it was possible. And and yeah, I mean, that happens quite frequently. You know, I'm just trying to go to the book there, Liz. I can't think of anybody in the book. I mean, maybe a really good person in the book is um, Larry Crandell's daughter, uh, Leslie. She is an avowed scientist. And and she said when she had this experience with her father and her experience with her father was she's at the bedside with Larry, her father, as he's dying. And by the way, Sarah, her uh, Larry's grand uh, daughter and Leslie's niece is there as well. So they're both at the bedside. And all of a sudden, these birds come up to the window that like the big flock of birds and they start singing and singing and singing. They said they never heard such a cacophony of, you know, beautiful bird noises right at their window. The, their father, uh, Leslie's father turns to look at the, at the birds, acknowledges the splendor, closes his eyes and dies right there. And then as Leslie is looking out the window at the birds, she sees her father greeting his mother and his three other siblings and they're arm in arm and her father is dressed in his military outfit from World War II and his other siblings are dressed in their favorite outfits and looking younger and vibrant and they're embracing the mother and everyone is so happy and Larry looks back at Leslie and singles to her telepathically. We're all good here. All is well. I'm with my family and I'll see you later. And she is, like I said, she's a scientist and she's just like, oh man, what do you make of this? Um, But, you know, she was willing to share her story in in the book, primarily because Larry was such a, and Larry had done the training, but not with Leslie. I had trained Larry with his son. Um, Stephen and uh, they'd done the pathway program. And so Stephen thought he was going to have the experience, but he actually went out to get a sandwich. Not that it made a difference because of course he could have had a remote SDE, but he was distracted, you know, um, in a certain way. He was talking to his the other brother, but Leslie was there sitting vigil with Sarah. So they had it. And I rarely say things like this because I like, well, it isn't strong evidence, but Maybe, I mean, they were the ones who needed it the most because, you know, they were the ones that all didn't believe this. So maybe there was some plan to it happening this way. Again, that's not evidential, but it's worth considering. Oh, I like what you're saying there, because, you know, a lot of times one of the unfortunate pieces with the SDE is that, well, why did... Why did she get that experience and I didn't? And we've had that a lot. Um, But what invariably works out in the discussion, because I tend to bring the families together to talk about it, is that that the family members who didn't have it say something like, you know, I really wanted to have it. But if someone, if there was a person that needed to have that with, you know, our father or mother or whoever, it was she, he, or they, and that, and I get it now. It works out. And then often that person will have another post-death uh, shared crossing, like a visitation or a profound synchronicity or, you know, something that they, this happens a lot. And I get a call and they go, Hey, you know, I was really kind of bummed. I didn't get the SDE when dad died, but just last night he came to me. And I could see him. He was at the foot of my bed and he was dressed up in that way when he, when we used to play basketball together. I love playing basketball with him. He came in his basketball uniform. He looked at me and he said, I'm playing basketball up here. I'm just fine. I'm waiting for you to get here. 
I love you. Boom. Wow, that that's amazing. And I guess I have a question about that. I know you mainly focus on at the time shared death experiences, but how has anyone ever had an after death communication way down the line that you feel is as profound as the shared death experiences? Well, when you talk about after death communications, ADC, as we call it, those can happen. Those happen anytime after a death and they can go, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years after the death. Um, and there are some profound after death communication. Don't get me wrong. I mean, they're, they're, they're wonderful, but they typically don't have the otherworldly phenomena that the SDE have, like, you know, the heavenly realms or the, you know, they don't even have the life review. They don't have um, seeing the light in this way. ADC is usually a profound communication that delivers some sort of understanding, insight, or healing. I love ADC. And, I, you know, a lot of the phenomena I do on my shared crossing spectrum, I just, uh, is ADC. But I only, only focus on that within the first year or so because I'm interested in end of life experiences. Now, one thing that I really loved in your book was I felt you, there was every single shared death experience had not only a profound kind of emotional component to it, but each one I felt had its own very strong evidential piece to it. And I would say each one was as evidential as the other from my perspective. And it's kind of what I feel about afterlife research in general. It's when you start to put them all together that it just becomes so strong. Is there yeah. an one of them that you found was the most evidential, that you found the most inexplicable by normal means, or a component of one of them that you'd like to share? Um, well, as you know, uh, as I've explained, the most the most evidential aspect of the SDE is the pattern. You know, it's the fact that you can't make this stuff up. I mean, we have the virginal research right now with, with my book coming out, it came out and, and now that it's really getting out into the, you know, the culture. And now this is, you know, this is a, a trope. I mean, now people can say I had this, this, and this, and it's not virginal research because now it's out in the public sphere. But, but we still have, you know, 250 cases that we've crunched prior to this. And, uh, and the patterns are just profound. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, there's amazing stuff that happens. I mean, the most common one is the remote SDE. You know, any of the remote SDEs. Like, you know, take, for example, Allison in, in, in my book. Allison is shopping. She's just shopping at an outlet. And as she's shopping, all of a sudden, she, she has this vision and communication she receives from her friend who she knows is in Great Britain, but she didn't know she's dying. Friend comes to her and says, hi, I just had to go. I, it was my time. I don't, I didn't, you know, I didn't know, you know this, but I was very, I'm very, I was been very sick and I'm just leaving. I want to say thank you. I love you for our friendship and I'll, you know, I'm going to be fine. I hope to see you again. Well, Allison describes never stopping shopping, even walking out to her car. And there's this communication went on for like, I don't, I can't remember if it was 20 minutes or 40 minutes, went on for quite some time. And finally, when it's over, she stops and she goes, oh my God. And then you know, she gets a phone call and she looks at the cell phone and she sees it's coming from UK and she goes, oh, I know who this is. This is going to be a mutual friend who's going to say, my friend just died. She picks it up and she goes, hey, I got some bad news. She goes, I know. You know, she just died. And she goes, yeah, how'd you know? She goes, no, I just, she just came to me. It's like, so we have a lot of evidential stuff like that. The remote SDEs are o almost always chalk like that. Yeah, I loved that case with Allison because it was her friend, not a family member, not someone that was on the top of her mind, you know, because you could say maybe there's some instinct of a you know, if someone has a heart attack, maybe you're subconsciously picking something up if you're around the person all the time, but she wasn't around this person. Another that I found amazing was 
when there'd be accidents, like a young person having a car accident? Yeah. So there are a number of accidents. Unfortunately, the accidents are often, not all the time, but often with young people. At least in the book, I tried to highlight those. I'll tell you one that I really like, and this is Sarah McCarty. And she just wakes up one morning here in Santa Barbara and early, she's sweating. She starts vomiting. They're gonna, her family members say, we're going to take you to the, to the emergency room. And she goes, yeah, let's go. She's getting on her clothes. And all of a sudden, she starts feeling a little bit better. And, they, and she goes, well, let me wait. I think something's passing. Maybe it was something I ate. And then she gets a call. And the call comes in from her sister. And her sister says, I have some very unfortunate news. Your niece just died uh, of an accidental drug overdose. And so she puts two and two together and she realizes, oh my gosh, I was experiencing Layla's transition because that's exactly what a drug overdose feels like. The sweating, the vomiting, the body aches, the convulsions. And it helps. I we have Dr. Monica Williams on our uh, on our as our medical director for the research team, and she can we look at these sympathetic cases in terms of the you know the symptoms that are coming forth, and we run them by her, and she does a match and says this is what the you know pathology would show here, if you will, and um, and we match them up. You know, so we have a lot of cardiac cases where a loved one will say that they were short of breath and felt chest pains at the exact same time that a loved one died. And they didn't even know the person was dying. So, Which is so amazing. And I mean, it's absolutely yeah. tragic when there are deaths. But I mean, I feel having this, it's just evidence that we already all know we're going to die. We all know our loved ones are going to die. So having this whole unknown body of research is very comforting. Have you ever heard of any where there's more than one person experiencing the shared death experience, like three, you know, two people will experience it with the person who's crossing. And if so, what similarities did they see? Or Yeah. Great question. You know, and I, I, I think I explained that, but if I didn't, excuse me, um, we have a multi-person SDE happens about 11 to 12% of the time. And I'm, and I'm sure there is more, it's more often than that. The reason why we don't get as many cases that way is oftentimes when there's multiple people having it, there's one in the group or family that doesn't want to share it. You know, to share these experiences uh, for some people, if it doesn't fit with their spiritual religious background or, you know, their their beliefs about reality, they don't want anyone to know they had these, you know. So so they'll so we don't get the research. I have a, so many of these cases where Someone comes in and she wants to share and says, oh, yeah, my brother had something. My dad had something when my mom died. And I go, oh, can I talk to all of them? And they said, oh, they don't want to talk about it, you know, so because they don't want to be known for this, you know. Yeah, so they happen. And, you know, the case I just shared with Sarah and Leslie, they both had the shared death experience um, with Larry. And, you know, as I said, Leslie was the daughter and Sarah was the granddaughter. And they had they had. Similar experiences around the birds. Leslie had more of the vision of the seeing the greeting party, the depart the the uh, deceased loved ones, Larry's family members meeting him, and then Sarah had some other experiences as well that I talk about in the book. This sense of heightened sense of knowing and awareness and sublime feelings. So yeah, you can get different experiences for sure but there's oftentimes there's a similar similarity in at least some of the experiences and you can have experiences where somebody ex has the experience at bedside and someone else has the experience remote that's always interesting yeah that was actually what i wanted was about to ask is if people have these in different locations yeah we have those too yeah it's all i mean i find this all just really kind of life-changing, hopeful, profound. And I'm going to ask the kind of, I guess, this final question or final two. Why do you think, what do you think is the most compelling reason it can be like 
really anything, whether evidential or just something you feel from your experiences, that this is genuine and not coping mechanisms for fear of death, either your own during an NDE or fear of death of a loved one. Why do you think this isn't fantasy and it's genuine and genuine evidence of an afterlife? Well, the probably the most compelling observation I have is that the SDE happens in the minds of unsuspecting people. They're, they're everyday, normal people, ordinary people, often without any spiritual inclination at all, that know nothing about this experience. And when they share it with me, they come to me, it's typically like, you know, I heard that you talk about these experiences, you study these, can I run this one by you? I had it, it was really profound, but I haven't, I haven't shared it with anybody yet. So it's that. It's that the people that share these are not, you know, dressed in purple going to new age gatherings, proclaiming any, any particular view about an afterlife or not. In fact, most of the people that I interviewed and chose for the book are particularly uh, normal, average people and from a diversity of backgrounds and ethnicities. And you'll see from around the world. In my book, I, you know, got, you know, mostly North Americans, but a number of people in, in Europe and, and New Zealand and Australia. And so, yeah, that's that. And I'll tell you one other thing here, Liz, you know, I love the phenomena for sure. They're exciting stories. They, they speak of an afterlife that's benevolent and it's good. But what I really appreciate is the profound after effects the transformative value of the SDE is remarkable beyond words. Almost 90% of our respondents, our participants in the research, will express that they know there is a benevolent afterlife and they know that their loved one is there and they know that they'll see them again. And their own view of the afterlife has also increased to, you know, close to 80, 90%, maybe even a hundred percent. We don't ask the question every time. So these are conservative numbers and that people's grief is largely improved in terms of their re uh, reconciliation or res grief resolution process. They certainly will feel the loss of a loved one. We all do because that's a loss of a loved one is a quite a painful experience, but, but, they hold that loss with a greater understanding imbued or engendered in them from the shared death experience that this is all part of the greater plan, the divine plan of the universe, that, that life, human life sits inside a larger, beautiful reality. And because of that, the bereaved grieve with a great deal more uh, ease, peace of mind. Uh, knowing that this is the way things go and that there's a benevolent afterlife awaiting us all. And it seems to make facing the un inevitable of both future losses and our own mortality. I, I know there were was a story in there about where a woman had had a previous loss and then of a baby and then, you know, lost the teenage daughter and just... That's Michelle. Yeah, that's yeah that she was able to cope with that. Uh, I mean, I won't give away the whole story because it's so worth reading, but I just kind of stood out to me how much more able she was to cope with her daughter's death, really feeling there was a knowing where her daughter was. Yeah, you said it quite well, is that Michelle would never say that, uh, you know, her grief is lessened in any way for the loss of uh, certainly Grace as well, Ben, who died at birth. Grace died in a car accident at 19 years old, tragically. But she will say that, that those experiences have provided some meaning and context for the losses that make her life livable. So thank you so much for coming on. I think this was just an especially fascinating discussion. I was really excited to have you because I honestly could not put your book down. It really resonates with how my mind works, where it's profound, but it's very factual aspect to them. So, you know, for me, it was one of those not able to put down books. So I really think all you guys would love it. And 
Again, it's at Heaven's Door by William Peters. Can you just tell everyone where they can find you and also where they can find the Shared Crossing Project and everything else that I think our listeners would like to be able to look further into? Yeah, thanks. I mean, you can find me at sharedcrossing.com. And if you're interested in learning or learning more about shared death experiences, we have some resources on there. We have the spectrum of end of life experiences, definitions. And I, what's really popular now on our website is our story library. So you can hear, I think we have 10 recordings uh, from our interviews. They're, they're not the full length. We get them down to manageable three to seven minutes. And you can listen to people tell their shared death experiences. And they're beautiful and profound. I mean, they'll do a better job than I did here today because they're telling their own story with their own emotion and affect and what have you. Um, so there's that. So that's a great resource. So if you're like anyone doubts uh, these things, you can always refer. You can go to their, yourself or refer friends and family to say, yeah, this is listen to these guys talk. These are profound experiences and the people are average, normal, healthy. Uh, so there's that. And you'll also, if you're interested in our courses and you know workshops and what have you, that's also on our website. And if you want, you know, we really would like to have you uh, on our mailing list so we can let you know about it, any of these programs that we have. Uh, we're going to put them all online. So, you know, f- in person doesn't matter uh, for if you want to do everything we have to offer online. We try to do a lot of our programs online. And that pathway program is the way you prepare to have a shared death experience. And it's profound. I mean, I'm telling you, I mean, I'm the lead teacher in it and and it's the favorite th- course that I teach because people will talk about during the course having out of body experiences and they go figure out how that happens but we do set up a field and it, it's a wonderful experience. Yeah, and then we're on social media, you know, Share Crossing Project or Share Crossing on Facebook, IG. You we have just started a YouTube channel and there's oh there's great resources also we have other teachings and interviews. I did an interview with Raymond Moody that was really good. Excuse me. Well, Raymond and I just taught a class together, um, but there's more interviews with Raymond and I, questions and answers, all sorts of stuff that we're just gradually putting out. So really appreciate everyone's interest and spread the word. If you read the book and like it, a review helps a lot because as Simon & Schuster says, a book like yours, people will love it, but they may not want to put their name on the review. And the reason why is so many rational people will love it, but they don't want they don't want to have a friend say, hey, I saw your great review of that, you know, that kind of new agey book. And and so Simon Schuster has told me, please ask people to do reviews because it just so helps. And you got to say, I was an atheist. I didn't believe this stuff. Tell your story so that other people who may be skeptical will um, take, t- you know, read it and see for themselves. To get more information on what the fuck just happened. To get updates on when the book launches, download Grief Bingo, and more, go to wtfjusthappened.net, check us out, and subscribe to our newsletter. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. It makes such a difference, especially for a new podcast like this one. And if you've had any crazy what the fucks yourself, have any questions, feedback, or just want to say hi, reach out either on Instagram at WTF underscore just underscore happened underscore or email me at hello at WTF just happened.net. And remember, you don't have to draw any final conclusions as you wonder what the fuck just happened.